Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Stephen Zuber. Welcome back from our Christmas vacation, Stephen. How are you doing? Pretty good. Christmas Excellent. went great. <laughs> Mine too. It was very non-eventful. I'm glad that no asteroid hit the Earth or anything else unnewsworthy. Exactly. If uh, something very newsworthy did happen, it's not because we're recording this before anything happened. It's just because we've already taken care of it, so there's no point in commenting on it. That's right. It's definitely not the 23rd. By the time this comes out, I will probably be in Europe. I'm not sure exactly, so we're recording a little early. So you haven't got your ticket yet either. I do have my ticket. Oh, you just don't know when this is coming out. Gotcha. Yes, I have not looked that forward that far ahead on my calendar because I'd have to flip a page and... Honestly, it wouldn't even be flipping a page because I don't have a physical calendar. Who has those anymore? I'd have to click a button. That sounds exhausting. I just can't do it anymore, man. All right. So I got to ask, is it a one-way ticket? No. Okay. I thought you were going to just wing it. I'm actually going to Wes's big 40th birthday party. So it's not like I'm going to have a lot of downtime to do things between, but I have a return date and everything. Nice. Yeah, I see Wes. I appreciate. I see the invites as well. And I, if I'm ever in the neighborhood, I will 100% come. But yeah. it's just a bit of a drive. So <laughs> that used to me be my same philosophy. And then I was like, oh, fuck it. What, what else do I got going on for the next decade of my life? Right. Let's, uh, let's start doing things and seeing things. I appreciate that mindset. Hold on there, Steven and Eniash from the past. We have forgotten something. We are kicking off the new year doing promotions for Guild of the Rose, as was covered in the last episode. The Guild of the Rose, it's a place where you can go to learn practical ways to actually level up your rationality in real life. It's a great place. We are big fans, and that is why we are partnering with them. But yeah, we're new to this whole shill thing. Actually, it was a good time. I got to meet with David Youssef last night, who is another council member of the Guild of the Rose. We talked briefly about Guild of the Rose stuff. He and Matt are working on operationalizing how to set better New Year's resolutions. So if you would like to know about how to actually set reasonable New Year's resolutions and execute on them, then check out the Guild of the Rose. I'm going to just say that if you listen to this show and you like it, there is a remarkably high chance that you will like the Guild of the Rose. Check that out. Link in the show notes. Back to the past, which is the future for everyone who is still listening. Happy New Year. I yes. felt like this job that keeps me changed my desk, but it's, you know, yeah, it's pretty awful. It is. You know, what else is getting is awful is when people are out to get you, Stephen. This is an episode that you pitched because you like found this awesome this awesome blog post by Zv. I remember reading it at some point in the past, and I couldn't quite remember where I saw it. And then you linked it to me. And I'm like, oh yeah, Zv. He's the guy who did all the uh, rationalist COVID stuff, basically. Yeah, uh, Zv Mauschowitz which I've, I'm giving 50-50 odds of whether or not it's a real last name. Uh, Sudoku Naitai is like the subtitle there. So I get it. Nerd reference. Uh, hmm. You know, I don't know how I found this because I definitely wasn't just perusing his blog. The main downside is that if there's no order to anything on, on his website. You can't just like find by category. It's really, I think, just by date. What if I want to find the COVID stuff? Like I have to Google and try my luck or just keep clicking the the next button going back through the months on posts. That's a good point. One of the downsides of Substack, maybe the only downside, is that you can't put categories on posts. This post is called Out to Get You. And dun, dun, dun. I know, it's awesome. What I loved about it, it contextualized and gave language to all of my old man yells at clouds moments. Yes. And it's it's just perfect for all of that. You are older now than you were in the past, right? That's true. Now and now and now. <laughs> Excellent. So have you found yourself yelling at clouds more as you get older? <sighs> I mean, definitely more than I like as a trend, sure. But I don't think it's a constant upward trend. I don't think it's more every day than it was the previous day. I think I have weeks where I'm more zen, you know, and then days where I'm extra pissed or something, right? Yeah, but more generally like on a year to year basis. Yeah, probably. Although Do maybe think- less now than a couple years ago. Do you think that's purely a side effect of aging or what's behind that? To explain the reference, if anyone hasn't seen The Simpsons, there's like a newspaper clipping of Grandpa Simpson shaking his fist and yelling at clouds. And it's just subtitled, Old Man Yells at Clouds. And I think it's just because he's just mad and wants to yell, right? Because old people are always yelling about everything these days, even to, you know, the point of the clouds nowadays aren't the same as they were back in the day. Exactly. I don't want to say it's just a side effect of aging. I don't think it's necessarily just like, oh, my meat suit is older. It's like, oh, maybe I've seen more stuff. And Mm -hmm. like, I have more points of reference for why things don't actually have to be this shitty. I don't want to just resign myself to saying this just what happens when you get old. Because like, some people are chill as fuck when they're old. 
Yeah. And I, I think that that's still totally attainable. I hope so. I do remember recently seeing a thing that the people who've been around long enough to remember what things were like in the past are the only ones that can complain because they were the only ones that realized that things used to be better. Yeah, I guess if you'd been brought up in a shittier system your entire life, you just you wouldn't know that things could be better. And so it might sound like older people are bitching all the time. You know, it's funny. You know, I got to spend a lot of time around people younger than me. Um, <laughs> I am constantly around people younger than me, which I think is really good for me. Continue. Sorry. Well, I, I guess I'm just thinking like I almost never get out. And I was going to say around kids or young people, but that sounded it depends on how young you're talking. But like my cousin is 22 and I saw her over Thanksgiving. She was born January 2000 or 2001. She's never lived in a pre 9-11 United States. I guess what I'm saying is like, I think kids these days, they're hugely disgruntled because they see on their phones all day about how terrible everything is. And like, before we get into people getting out to get us all the time, which they are, and you should be worried about, or you should be aware of that. I don't know, man, things are pretty good. I think kids these days complain a lot. And it's funny because they do it without context. That's the one sentence version of what I was trying to say. They get context yeah. from their phones about like, oh yeah, back in... The 90s, you, you know, you could buy a house for the price of a McChicken and go to college <laughs> on while you worked three days a week on McDonald's over the summer. And then you'd save all your rent and tuition money and go to college, which isn't that much of an exaggeration. The first one was, but the second one is you could absolutely, for save money from a summer job, pay for rent and college all year and then go back to work in the summer. I certainly couldn't. No, I, I'm thinking uh, more like, I was going to say our parents, I don't know, your parents are 70? Mid 60s. Same with mine. Wait, really? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. No, I, I was reallying myself, not questioning oh, oh, your, okay. your assessment. I don't actually. You take it your parents had you a little bit later in their lives then? Yeah, it must be. I think they were 30. It's funny. I, I don't know immediately off how old they are. I probably should. When they were going, when they had the opportunity to go to school, it was crazy cheap, especially like as, as a percentage of income. Right. I know like inflation's a thing, but we talked about this with housing, which we'll talk about a lot during this episode. Houses now are, I don't know, 10 times the price they were. 30 years ago, maybe eight, but wages are not 10 times what they were 30 years ago. Yeah. They're maybe one and a half times, you know, maybe twice. Just to bring some additional context in, it's like the houses in places that most people want to live are that much more. Uh, you can get a, a house in rural Ohio for $12,000, according to at least one person in rural Ohio that I follow. So is that still know. true? That is still true, yes. Okay. Well, what what's out to get you? What's going on here? The overarching theme of the post. Some things are fundamentally out to get you, capitalized. Oh, what does that mean, out to get you? Oh, yes. They seek your resources at your expense. Or they seek resources at your expense. Fees are hidden. Extra options are foisted upon you. Things are made intentionally worse, forcing you to pay to make it less worse. Least bad deals require careful search. Experiences are not as advertised. What you want is buried beneath stuff you don't want. Everything <laughs> is data to sell you something rather than an opportunity to help you. If you're checking out on any website, oh, want to add this to your cart? No, I put the stuff I wanted to buy, right? Mm -hmm. the, the line, things are made intentionally worse, forcing you to pay to make it less worse. And the whole out to get you spectrum, the things that I particularly latched onto more uh, that I really liked were... The concept of things that want absolutely everything they can possibly take from you and like don't ever have any stop limit. I think the example he used, and maybe we'll get to it, is social media, basically any sort of engagement thing wants literally all of your time. To nowadays that goes to video games too. They will endlessly take every single minute of your day, always adding more things because every minute that they have is an improvement by their metrics, I guess. If you aren't careful, it will take literally every minute without you even realizing it. Uh, tuition for colleges, both tuition for colleges and medical expenses. Nobody knows like what it really costs, it seems like. For colleges, I think there's still some people at the top that can tell you roughly how much it's it actually costs. But the sticker price is always more money than you possibly have. Infinite money, right? And then through various <laughs> discounts and means testing, that gets lowered down to exactly as much money as you have, which sucks. <laughs> I don't think it should be that way. The same thing happens for medicine. Uh, it's even worse in the case of medicine because there, most of the time, the people giving you the medicine can't even tell you what it costs. They're like, dude, I don't know. We do the procedure somebody sends some paperwork somewhere it gets shuffled all around eventually we get some money you paid some money at some point we're sure the insurance does something in the middle and in the end you have far less money 
every, everyone else has a little bit more money and you got the medicine, it usually comes out to just enough to take all of your money, which is why you get bills from the emergency room for like $50,000, which you end up paying two and a half thousand dollars of or whatever it was that you have in your bank account, right? Those out to get you things are the particularly insidious ones, in my opinion, where they're just like literally the price tag is infinite and it gets lowered down to everything that you have. It's a special kind of insidious because you're right. Like even the people there who want to help, they're not being dicks about it. They just actually can't tell you with an order of magnitude how much this yeah. is going to cost. Hey, I came in for a broken bone. Is this going to cost me $200 or $2,000? And they're like, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Your deductible that you got to set up your card for is 50 bucks. You'll, yeah. you'll get a bill. And <laughs> we, we don't know. You're sitting there at home with your broken arm. Googling with your non-broken arm, trying to figure out mm -hmm. which doctors are in network and stuff. So you go to the right urgent care, and then they consult with a doctor outside of your network, and you get this enormous bill for that. I don't know. Is that better or worse than the ones who are actually trying? I think that's it's a different kind of worse than the ones who are, like the people who are actually trying to fuck you. Yes. Right? Back when I bought my second most recent car in like 2013, you could haggle. It was awesome. Like on Seinfeld or the movies. Oh, did they not do that anymore? No, I went to at least three different dealerships in uh, January 2020. It was when I bought my new car. They're like, yep, that's the price. And I was like, but for real, if I gave you $500, could you take $1,000 off this car? And he's like, no, there's actually nothing we can do. So they can't even take bribes to lower the, lower the cost. That's interesting. I think that's probably good because now there's just a sticker price, yeah. right? So you can actually compare. And that's like, that's actually your price out the door. There was a period in my life where I went through like, where I averaged more than one car a year. One of them was like, it was a insurance check from someone who totaled my previous car. I find the car is like, perfect. That's how much money I have. It was like $5,000. Actually, it was stickered for eighty eight eighty eight, And I said, I've got 5,000 in cash today. Can I leave with this car? And he's like, yeah, you bet. And then he goes and does all like the, let me talk to the guy on the tall desk in the edge of the facility kind of thing. All right. Well, with lot fee of $400 and you know, this other fee for 200, that's going to be 56 or whatever. And I was like, oh, well then never mind. Right. And, and he's like, I've never seen a car deal fall through for $600. And I was like, well, you're about to. Sorry, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but I don't actually have that money. I, I came in with a check. This is this is how much I have. And then, of course, it went magically went down to 5, 5K. The other funny thing about buying a car this this time was I didn't actually, like, I didn't need a new car this week or whatever. Mm -hmm. when, when, like, your car is broken and it's like, all right, I'm getting dropped off at dealerships to try and shop for a car. Then you kind of like, you know, there's the pressure. Yeah. When you don't need it, it gives you this awesome power. You're like, oh, you're, you have no control over me here. This is awesome. Yes. Um, That's how you always want to be when you're buying things. We should we should list out the responses to when your people are out to get you so we can tie on all of our ramblings to one of the responses here. Okay. That And that's literally um, what this blog post is about, right? Yes. Some things are out to get you. Here's what you do in response. Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, what are the four responses? Get gone. Walk away. Say, fuck it. I'm out. Um, cool. You get got. You bite the bullet. Uh, you you give the thing everything it wants. Pay up, relax, and enjoy the show. An example of this might be concert tickets and uh, you know movie tickets. Like, all right, cool. Twelve fifty for a fucking movie. All right, whatever. Oh, what's this? Three dollar online fee. One dollar convenience fee. What the hell? Why are you? What's convenient about me paying you guys four dollars to buy a movie ticket? To be fair, to be it fair. is convenient. <laughs> it is convenient to not have to get in your car, drive to the theater, buy the tickets, and then drive back. You know, several hours before the movie starts. I know. I. The thing <laughs> okay. is, sometimes it's like separated out in different fees, mm, and I, okay. I, I just like call it the same thing. You know, whatever. But like, the, it's also just like, all right, theater. You and I both know that it costs you less for me to buy it online, and yet you're saying, you know what? I'm going to call your bluff, customer. You're not going to drive out here and pick it up. Fuck you. And mm -hmm. they're right. So yes. I get God, right? <laughs> right. I believe that is called price discrimination. I like the I like the phrase, but it's not clicking for me. Price discrimination is where you sell things to people for the price that they are willing to pay for it. Uh, coupons oh, are a rather great, than what it's worth. Well, I mean, that's always the case, but you, you know, if you have a $12 chicken that you're trying to sell, uh, you would like to get $12 for it, but it only costs you, I don't know, $6 to stock it in the store, right? So if there is someone who would buy it for $10, but they absolutely will not buy it for 12, you'd rather sell to them for 10. But you don't want to sell to everybody for 10 because you're leaving profit on the table because most people would buy it for 12. So you put a coupon out there, which is kind of a pain in the butt. You got to go looking for it. You got to cut it out. You got to bring it into the store. But if you do that, you'll get $2 off. 
it makes it more annoying to get those extra $2. Uh, so the people who can afford to not be annoyed and pay $12 for the chicken will do that. Whereas the people who really want the extra $2 will show that they really want those extra $2 by going through the annoyance. And therefore, you can discriminate uh, who you sell to based on the price that they can pay. And like how much time they have might be another factor, right? Sure, you wait in this long line, which means you you know have to be the kind of person who has an hour-long lunch break or something rather than 30 minutes. Yep. And you can get the discounted price. Yeah, it's weird. Money. And I know that like technically the price of like what it's worth are is what people will pay for it. Mm-hmm. But it's still something about that grinds my gears. And like I understand mm-hmm. that's, that's literally how the economy works. That's that's how money works. I always kind of just think about like bringing water to a an area with a drought or something. I went to Costco, bought a a U-Haul full of water for literally sixty bucks, mm-hmm. and I'm going to sell each bottle to you for mm, forty dollars because you'll <laughs> die without it. You know, granted, somebody will just shoot you, but my, my, the idea is just like, I feel like you're doing something gross and other Do, people say you're a genius entrepreneur and that's a great business strategy because you're turning an enormous yeah. profit, but yeah. I feel like you're shafting people. And I, I know that that's not how the system can work. The system can't really work the other way, but it's, I still don't like it. You've heard of places having droughts before, right? I have. Have you ever rented a U-Haul, filled it with bottled water and driven to those places to sell it at cost? Well, No. Would you do that if someone was willing to offer you, I don't know, $30 a bottle? I mean, there's some number where I do it, right? I, I see your point. Okay. I, but like, yeah. I. So the alternative is basically no water. Yes. And like I said, so I get it. It's just like, you know, we, we can turn it even nastier, right? Like, and I think mm-hmm. we've, I've, I've used this example in the past, but it's like, all right, go to war torn country X and be like, oh, hey, yeah, I, can, yeah, I, can, I can save your family, but I want to be able to fuck your daughter whenever I want. You know, so either y'all die by getting decapitated by warlords here, or I get to rape your kid. And it's like, well, I guess, you know, if my other five children and, and me get to survive, uh, yeah, sure, have this terrible rape situation. I still feel like, hey, you saved five people. And I know that yeah. those, those situations aren't comparable with, you know, price gouging water. It, to me, it's like, all right, let's just slide the slippery slope all the way to the bottom. And suddenly you're <laughs> you're like, well, would you rather them all die than one get raped? And it's like... <laughs> Well, the lovely thing about slopes is that you can actually put blocks up to prevent slides all the way to the bottom. <laughs> all right, do we want to work through these um, deep dive or do we want to run through them quick drive by and then kind of circle back and do deeper dives? Let's do a quick drive by first. So the first thing is get got, like Stephen said, uh, just pay up all of it and don't worry about it. Much more relaxing way to go, but you lose a lot of money. Uh, you, The second one is get compact. Find a rule that limits just how much it can get you for and then get got up to that limit. Uh, you can get ready, which means go to battle and fight. Uh, and then you can get gone, which is just the walk away, don't even engage and not get the thing that is being offered at all. And now we dive in, yes? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. The one that he starts with first is get got. Give the thing everything that it wants. Sometimes it is worth it to get got, but it comes with a warning from Zvi here that you sometimes will think that getting got is reasonable in this case, and just thinking that it's reasonable is insufficient because something that is out to get you is engineered to fool you. It was something may look reasonable, but it, in the end, it never actually is. So only accept things that are in capital letters worth it all the way. I'm trying to think of things that would fit neatly inside and outside of that category. This sort of example will probably come up until it annoys everybody. But I bought a house this year, and yeah. this was the worst year maybe in the history of the fucking country to buy a house. Um, certainly in the history of my life. We signed for it in December 2021, actually almost exactly a year ago. Interest rates were three, two, five, and you know, sure, the market was kind of crazy. The reason we bought, we signed for a new construction was because we couldn't buy a house that existed because people kept offering ten or fifteen percent over asking in cash because yeah. they knew that they could turn around in a year and make a profit anyway, even if they paid five hundred seventy thousand dollars for a five hundred k house. So we're like, all right, fine, let's buy a place that won't exist for ten months, whatever. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. you don't get to sign your mortgage until the house is done, which I think is stupid. And I, I could argue, I could make a good argument against, but... Wait, wait, how could you make a good argument against it? The house is being built whether or not I am buying it. Like, I signed that I'll be the one to buy it, mm-hmm. but let me just take out the loan for it. Well, the bank wants to do business with you, though, not with the construction company. Yeah, they are doing business with me. I'm, I'm promising well, that I'll, I'll pay this mortgage. Just let me, let me just take the mortgage out and I'll start paying it in 10 months. But what happens if you don't pay the mortgage? 
like the same thing that happens. Point of view. The same thing that happens if I didn't pay it, even if if I signed it after the house existed, they get the and house. It, <laughs> right, but from the bank's point of view, the house doesn't exist yet, so you are offering them nothing. So they'll, yeah, they'll they'll have to tighten their belts for ten months while the house gets finished being built, right? But the house is coming, whether or not I buy it. I don't think they want to take your word for that. If they wanted to do that, then they would do some sort of mortgage with the construction company. And then the construction company would assure them that the house is coming in 10 months. And they can be like, okay, we'll do business with you. But they're not in the business of buying houses from construction companies. They're in the office business of giving mortgages to individuals who want to buy houses. Well, sure. But the, the people who are funding, the people who built my housing community here, they're in that business, right? Mm -hmm. so like, sure, we'll give you a giant check to build houses just start selling them and then we'll talk about the next the next check people are buying promises of houses and that's good enough i suppose you could have made it work if you wanted to sit the two parties down at a table and the three of you all hash out a contract together oh yeah but... no it, it would have been impossible i think just the way that things are actually set up but okay. like if, if if things were reasonable and i could just you know if i could sit down and talk to a reasonable person who mm. could actually make the call i think i could have explained my situation anyway point is is that interest rates doubled in the inter in the next 10 months. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, I only had to pay 5,000 fucking dollars in May to lock down a rate of 575. Um, mm. So we saved half a percentage point, which is actually not inconsiderable. Um, yeah, you know, we'll ride it out till hopefully things go down and we can refinance and our mortgage will go down, yada, yada, that it was just all it was a whole kind of shakedown. Why did this come up? Mm. Oh, I don't think that's something that we needed to get but we kind of just wanted right mm. a new house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly once we signed for it, we weren't locked, locked in. I don't know what the actual cutoff point was. I'm sure it was in one of the things I signed, but I know that up to a point, we'd have only lost like a thousand dollars if we just left. Yeah. If we just blocked their number and, and, you know, stopped talking to them. I think this may be one of the reasons that the bank didn't want to give you a whole ton of money without a house actually being there. But then they could have the house. They don't want the house. Why not? Do you want someone's random car? Like it, this is this is a job for them to have a house and maintain it and sell it. They don't want that job. They want a different job. Yeah, like you could become a real estate agent and sell houses, but you don't want to do that. You want to be a programmer. Well, they'll take my house if I don't pay the mortgage, right? But you're saying you're, <laughs> say, you're saying they really don't want to do that. Yes. Okay. They, we don't want to do this. We just have to. We're not doing this because we want yeah. to. We're just doing it because you deserve it. Um, you, <laughs> right. need, you need to learn a lesson. All right. <laughs> This sort of comes up for me every now and then because they keep passing laws that makes it harder and harder to evict anyone in Denver. And I mean, on the surface, that seems okay, but like, I don't ever want to evict anyone. It's a huge pain in the ass. You got to go through the legal system. And for months at a time, you are not getting any sort of rent. And I still have to pay the fucking mortgage on this thing. Like, if I'm evicting someone, some shit has gone terribly wrong, and it is costing me hundreds of dollars a month at least. In total, it's probably going to be well over $10,000 that this goes out to. So, like, it, it is a last-ditch effort when there is no other option. And making it even harder to do this really sucks and just makes it harder to rent out to places because I have to trust people even more that they aren't going to default and ruin years. So yeah, I, I don't want to evict someone just like the bank doesn't want to foreclose on your property. But if they've given you $500,000 and you've walked away with it and aren't paying back anything, they're going to be like, well, okay, I guess we'll take the house and we'll try to recoup as much of that as we can. Yeah. I take your point. The main difference is like, they didn't just give me a check and I got to cash it and then spend it on a house if I felt like it, right? It goes to the house, no ifs, ands, or buts. You know, it's kind of funny. Like if you just didn't pay your mortgage while you're evicting somebody, what's the bank going to do? You know, they're going to try to repossess your house? Yes. Like, yeah, I know. But like, they probably have just as hard a time with that as you do evicting somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks for everyone. Yeah. All right. We're, I, I'm doing a bad job keeping us on point here. What is the capital letters worth it? I guess like, I was going to say food, but like, have you been shopping in the last couple of years? I have never shopped in my life, actually. If you ever go to the store to get food, you like go around, you pick it up off the shelves, put it in a cart and you go to checkout. A week's worth of food, depending on your, your needs, might be like, let's say a hundred bucks in 2020. Now it's seriously like $160. I mean, and I, I know you go grocery shopping, right? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't everything way more expensive? Like a head of lettuce is like $3 where it used to be like 50 cents. Like not used to be like in the good old days of 1919. This is like mm -hmm. the good old days of 2019. It does seem that things are getting more expensive, yes. Like wildly more expensive, I feel like. Okay, I'm going to confess something. I very rarely actually look at prices. 
every now and then my food bill or whatever bill just goes up high enough that I'm like, okay, wow, this is too much. And I start looking at the individual things I am buying. And then I'm like, aha, okay, this one somehow went up a whole lot. I'm going to see if I can find an alternative. But for the most part, I do that maybe once a year. And then after that, I just stick to buying the same stuff over and over and don't worry about it too much because I know I already did the work to try to find a good value. And I don't want to have to do that every single fucking time I walk into the store. Oh, 100%. That's how I roll too. What I found though is that while I did that, like I said, maybe once a year for the last 10 years, I've noticed that like five times in the last couple, in the last year. Okay. Where I get home, I finish checkout and I'm like, how is this $75 worth of stuff? This is three grocery bags. Yeah. You know, like, so that sort of thing. Um, Right. Then yes, I have noticed that. And meat specifically seems to have been going up a lot. It's wild. Mm. I think that I'm doing a bad job keeping this on point, but I mean, to be fair, not to be fair, God damn it! ever <laughs> since that fucking show, I was just going to say, isn't that part of the thing that we love about the Steven Zuber experience that there's constant digressions and like a sprawling train of thought stream of consciousness thing? This is how my brain just works. And this is, this is why I can't get ahead in life. Oh, I, I can't, I, I can't know. focus on anything for more than 30 seconds. So I'm like, Oh, what about this? Okay, sure. So that that is definitely a thing that can suck in some situations, but it also, <laughs> but, but it also um, is great for creativity to have a sprawling, crazy thing that you go chasing off down different rabbit holes. Yeah, keeps my brain going. All right. So Zvi's example, he, he uses uh, the example of concert tickets. There's the example of Facebook, which I think that actually it says in the post. This is to follow up to something about Facebook, which I didn't actually read. The out to get you aspect of Facebook so that it wants your entire life. Like yes. as, as its business model, as its implicitly expressed goal, spend 24 hours a day looking at the screen on Facebook, yeah. please. Twitter and- is taking the Facebook model and like high industrial grade refined it. Like Facebook was already the cocaine from the coca plant of interacting with people on the internet. And then I don't know what Twitter would be. What, what do you get when you refine cocaine even more? Uh, super cocaine. Okay. And Twitter is like super cocaine where it does the same thing where sometimes people spend too long engaging with one thing. Let's force people have the things be so short they fit in a paragraph because then people can just engage and get the dopamine hits much more frequently and get more addicted. It's it's crazy. It's it's a struggle. Yeah, I don't know how the long it takes. Real, bro. I don't know how long it takes to read a tweet, but I imagine like I, a second might be, you know, way too short, but I'm just thinking like, you can kind of just glance at it. Yeah. Maybe I'm thinking of like Reddit headlines as I'm scrolling through Reddit mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. those are probably about a second. Um, yeah. It's similar. Yeah. So the thing is like Facebook the is thing- like passive though, right? There's nothing that you want to do that you need Facebook for. That's it. I've missed like invites to parties and stuff. Cause I haven't checked my Facebook since earnestly since 2015. Um, I was going to say Facebook has very much for a lot of people, me included, just turned into the thing where like events are planned on Facebook and you don't really use it for much of anything else. So you do got to check it, I don't know, once a week just to see what events are coming up and what people are planning and doing in your community. I just hope someone will text me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so a, a real life example is uh, politics. Political mm, causes yes. want every spare minute and dollar. They want mm-hmm. to choose your friends, your words, and your thoughts. They want everything, right? Yes, they do. What you thinking? Well, so I, I'm thinking the, the politics thing. He says that this is also a thing that distinguishes cults from religions. That uh, cults want everything from you, and religions just want their cut, which is slightly different. He says one way that you can tell when something is out to get you is what happens if you cooperate, if you go along with getting got. Do you just get what you wanted or does this like just put blood in the water? And so suddenly you are asked for even more and more. And uh, that is just what politics feels like to me now. I don't know. Maybe in the past it wasn't like this. Did we want to bring up the specter of wokeism in all this? Yeah. I mean, certainly it's controlling thoughts and stuff. And- I think more more to the point, not just the controlling of the thoughts, but you can't just get in a little bit and be like, yeah, you're right on these and these points and this and this is important. It always wants more and it, it pushes you deeper in at all aspects. And if you don't follow along, then the response is worse than if you hadn't engaged in the first place. Isn't that wild? Mm-hmm. You get negative points for trying. Yeah. Pat Nozzle had a funny joke about that in his latest special, which is actually pretty good. You know, he's like, I, I'm woke, I'm progressive, but it's changing so fast. I'm sure I'm going to fall behind. You know, in 10 years, I'm going to be the guy who's like, I don't think you should fuck your clones. And people are like, look at this <laughs> fucking anti-clone piece of shit. And it's funny 
again, the so his, his line of cults want it all, religion wants its cut. Like, it depends on the religion, maybe. I guess that's actually maybe the difference. You know, the religions who want it all are cults. Um, yeah. But, you know, if it's just like, nope, just tithe and we'll leave you alone, then all right, cool, here's your 10%. But yeah, there's something about that kind of joking phrase about ethics where it's like, it's not your responsibility unless you interact with it. Oh yeah. The uh, Copenhagen interpretation. Of That's ethics. right. <laughs> That's kind of like how it is with wokest stuff is like, or it can be even on like the, the wokest edges of my friend group, they're mm -hmm. perfectly reasonable. Yeah. And then I go like to parties at their house or something and some of their friends are unreasonable, but I'm, I play, I'm polite. I'm not going to like argue with them on stuff, but the, the idea that like you try to keep up and you, you play along. Like maybe if Ro if J.K. Rowling, uh, I think her her big thing that everyone hates her for actually they they hate her for things that she didn't actually say or do. But my understanding, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. maybe I'm missing something, but mm -hmm. is that she's expressed an earnest concern about what if creepy like actual men want to get into women's bathrooms or changing rooms and do creepy things to women? Yes. Um, you know that's I think that's a perfectly sane concern. And it, what's weird is like everybody had that concern five years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Or 10. Yeah. You know, we don't want guys in our spaces. This is fucked up. I remember when I was at college, there was like a advertisement for like a women's only bike repair course. I'm like, shit, I could learn. I could use some bike repair skills, but I'm not invited. You know, and I get it. They want their own kind of stuff. Cause like, let's be real. Some guy's going to come in and ruin it. So like, I get why they're like, Hey, look, let's just get ahead of that. I think what people hate rolling for more is that she says like, Oh no, I'm actually woke and progressive because she actually is. Um, right. But then they see this one thing and they're like, look, you can't pretend to be one of us and not, right? You've got to be uh, in it 100%. Right. Yeah. There's no middle ground here. It's pretty fucked up. Yeah. This And this is nice. You can only pay off those who charge a bounded price and stay bought. Before you pay a ransom, be sure it'll free the hostages. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Facebook example, what are you buying and who are the hostages? There mm -hmm. aren't any. You're buying a dopamine hit and there are no hostages. You're just throwing money in this analogy it's throwing money into it right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there's actually there is no victory condition for facebook where there is with like a concert ticket yeah it's like look i got my ticket i get to sit down and watch the show yeah the reason i loved this that, that was the line that made me want to talk about this as an episode is just because like that is i think a a very important insight this is a, a keep your eye on the ball sort of thing what are you actually trying to get out of this and mm -hmm. if you get it, like, have you actually succeeded at whatever it is you want? If the answer is no, you probably should just stop doing that thing. Yeah. Maybe even if you don't like your job, it's like, well, I like the paycheck. That's actually a reward I'm actually getting, you know? Uh, mm, relationships are basically this, right? I was actually going to bring that up too. I think it depends. Okay. Right? Friendships aren't like, a, aren't like the Facebook relationship, right? That's true. Like... You, you can see your friends, you get to hang out, you enjoy a movie. I think suboptimal relationships are like that, where it's okay. like you, you, you can give and give, and it's like, oh, there's actually just no bottom to this well, is there? Okay, so I guess I should have been more explicit. Romantic sexual relationships are like this, right? I don't know. I The way that I talk about my relationship, it sounds like I'm like facetiously, sarcastically making up a great one, but it actually just is that chill. You know, there are days where like I'm in a rough mood or she's in a rough mood, but like it's never that bad. Like we don't actually fight. And people who say that are like, oh, good couple, every couple needs to fight. That's how you get through problems. So I'm like, I think that's just something people in bad relationships say. I don't like to give relationship advice because I think what works for me might not work for everybody. But I think you're right. Like this, this is how some relationships totally operate where it's like you can go all in or you can't play. And it, I don't think that's sustainable, right? I don't know. I've also heard from a lot of people that this is kind of like the ideal that you want as well. It's like the um, the Morticia and Gomez relationship model where everything is about each other and that is wonderful. And what else would you want out of life? Yeah. My mental model of Tish and Gomi is that uh, <laughs> if Gomez wanted to go, I was going to say fishing, but let's be real. If he wanted to go grave robbing with his friends for the weekend... Tish would be fine with that. Yes, but also the thing is he would never want that without her along or at least offer to be like, hey, you want to come too? Okay, you're right. They're weird. Like if, if they could actually sew themselves to each other, they would do it, right? Right. Yeah. So they're, they're a little too far in that direction for us to use them as, as models. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's Most people that I found consider that the ideal and want that. I don't know. My wife and I, if I want to go play video games and she wants to watch something I don't want to watch, we're totally fine spending 
the entire night apart from each other. And then we'll hang out and watch TV and go to bed together. Right. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. I'm extremely confident that there's no problem there. Uh, cause yeah. I, th- I feel like we communicate well about it. That's what makes us work well is that we, we have that same kind of balance, but not everyone has that same harmony, right? Not all relationships are get got ones. I certainly don't think so. Do you think society in general is pushing that as the ideal? Did I mention I go outside like once a week? <laughs> like I have no Fair idea. Enough. I have no idea what society is pushing. Um, okay. society is all of my weird friends. What are the, the rationalist nerds that hang out with, hang out with pushing? That feels like what society is pushing, but I know it's not. Gotcha. Um, do you and, think the rationalist nerds in general are along this sort of, at least the ones that you hang out with are along this sort of, um, continuum of, yeah, like the best relationship is one where everything is co-entwined. No, I think they're the, op- in my experience, they're, they're largely the opposite. It, okay. there, there's, there's a huge polyamory sub population mm-hmm. in the rationalist community. I think yeah. way above the base rate of the rest of the population. I also get that impression. Yes. And so they're definitely not thinking a relationship should be all in. Right. All right. Anyways, we are getting way off track. Yes. Sorry. No, no, you're right. I, I, I love these. Um, so to get compact means to find a rule limiting what everything it wants means in context, then get got, relax and enjoy the show. This is my general approach. Like the get got thing. I don't, I'm not aware of any of those that I'm currently in, you know, I'm getting fucked in a lot of avenues, right? Uh, <laughs> my mortgage is too high. I'll complain mm-hmm. about this stupid water thing later. Um, mm. but those don't want literally everything. They're just shaking me down, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's the difference between the the hypothetical selling water to a thirsty person thing. You know, if I'm selling it to for forty bucks, it's a shakedown. If I say how much you got, I want that. That's right. the difference. Um, yeah. So you know, but budget create create a max dollar loss. The downside, and I love this line too, is that if you set a maximum, that's basically how much you will spend up paying. Yeah. Especially if other people figure out what it is. Do your best yeah. to avoid this known bug. <laughs> right. <laughs> like the thing with your check. I mean, it was good that you had check for only 5,000 because it gave you a powerful um, negotiating position. You're like, I literally cannot pay you more. Either you get down to this or I, I have to go somewhere else. But on the other hand, it also meant that he knew he was going to get all 5,000 of your dollars. Right. He didn't know how much I had right up until, oh, you're right. It wasn't until I you know, basically talked him down from the initial sticker price. So yeah, he's like, there's no way I'm letting that kid leave with a car for less than Mm $5,000. Yeah. I'm trying to plan a vacation because we haven't taken one since uh, summer of 2019. I know my budget, like roughly, but luckily, like I don't have to talk to anybody to plan the vacation. The hotel's like, I'm never going to talk with them, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't like try and talk me into spending my maximum. What's the alternative of a budget? Uh, a budget alternative is a restriction on type where you just cut some things out entirely. And the example he gives is go to a restaurant and avoid alcohol, dessert, and appetizers, which is cool because those are generally things I try to avoid in restaurants as it is, especially appetizers. Those things are insanely priced. And, you know, I'm there for food. Yeah. You know, I don't want to buy a $9 thing. Well, it depends, you know, chips and salsa, whatever. But I like that example too, because this is something we do way more than is fiscally responsible. I don't know how often we go out to like a sit down restaurant. There's this place five minutes, 10 minutes away from us. It's like impossible to get in and out like, out of there for like f- less than 40 bucks. Hmm. And it is not $40 good. It's it's okay. kind of funny how overpriced it is. You know, a cocktail there's like $15. Jesus. And it's like, okay, cool. I love me a fancy cocktail. I don't love it $15, right? right. It's good. It's not $15 good. Desserts though, I can't make a fancy dessert at home. You know, if yeah. I could pay for some sort of decadent treat, then why not? You Go- can often buy a pretty good dessert, like at a grocery store. That's true. I'm trying to think of like another example, you know, like go to the, go to the sports, sports event, you know, where they're going to shaft you on tickets, but don't buy food there. Oh yeah. Never Certainly, get the concession set at a movie theater. Right. Yeah. Don't go to concession set at a movie theater, unless you're just craving popcorn and you know that 90 cents of the popcorn is $10 and you're just <laughs> okay with it. Right. But mm-hmm. you know, when, you know, just. You always go to the gas station and load your pockets if you feel like snacking on candy while you're watching the movie. Um, yeah. I like it. Time limits, another good example of compactness. But one of the big problems, apparently, is that you will always go exactly to your time budget, same as the dollar budget. A good quick example of this. Meeting to record podcasts, which is always fun. I enjoy doing it. But it is basically an entire Sunday, right? Mm-hmm. Um, don't get sucked into doing the whole thing. If somebody needs a hand with a project and you're like, yeah, I'd be happy to help. Don't let them like just take your whole day, even though they're not, you know, they're not being mean about it. It's just like, well, you could stick around. Sure. Whatever. But time is another resource that people, I think, 
should think of more like money. Yeah. Except you can actually earn money. The time is like, all right, here, you start with this much. You don't know how much it is. Go. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, You can't add time to the clock. One of the ways you can lose less time is by not using social media as much. One of the options he gives in this section is to look at social media only on computers, which I think is a wonderful piece of advice. I think that's a really good idea. I use my laptop for recording podcasts and 100% legally paying for TV shows and movies. And that's literally it. You know, once a month do I use it for something else? I could get by without a computer, basically. I think phones, they're just so easy to open it up and get sucked in anywhere without even noticing what's happening. I'm starting to think I should just leave my phone somewhere around rather than on my person often. Like if I'm in the house, just like put it on my desk. And if it rings, I can hear it. When I go to a store, leave it in the car, something like that. If I get stuck waiting in a line, I have to actually think about things. I have taken to doing that around the house. Now that I have a house, like it's not big, big, but it's big enough for me to like leave my phone in another room and not be able to hear it vibrating. And it's nice. It's funny. Like this is a problem. Like this isn't a problem that we had 20 years ago. And it's a problem that kids today have had their entire lives. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. Looking at social media only on computers, because then it's a chore. All right. I'm going to get on a check real quick, but I'm not going to sit at my desk and browse Facebook all, all night. Right. I mean, you might, we did it back in the early aughts, right? Right. But today no one would stand for it. <laughs> Isn't it weird how that happened? Yeah. Another good example of getting compact, I think he uses the example of uh, free-to-play phone games. You have to ask yourself, is it fun to play? Is it worth playing for free? And if it's not, then don't pay. Especially if it's one of those ones that will let you pay as much as you want. That said, there's another one I've been playing where it's one of those kind of grind games where numbers go up forever and Mm -hmm. uh, you can pay to make the numbers go up faster. Those are the ones that'll fuck you. They do fuck you. And I have paid probably... 30 or 40 bucks for this game in the last two months. Mm -hmm. That said, the Mm -hmm. amount of time I put into it is like way more than uh, hours of fun I get per dollar for like a movie or a triple A game, right? Is it actual fun? Yeah, I have a good time with it. Yeah, it's it's not it's not merely like a cookie clicker. If if it was just numbers go up, then like those are twisty. I played one of those for three days, like a few months ago, and I realized I had a problem. So like the first thing I did the morning that I was like, okay, this needs, I need to get this out of my life. I, before being fully, fully awake, just deleted it from my phone. I'm like, good. Okay. It's gone. Fuck it. I don't have to look at it. I'm never, yeah. never going back. Cause it was actually insidious. So when, when get compact instead of rule limit, like I don't have a hard limit for how much I'm going to spend on this stupid phone game, but mm-hmm. I'm never going to buy the hundred dollar monthly pass or something. Right. He does say that many budgets should be $0. I'm trying to think of like other examples though, cause you don't want to limit fun. Maybe it doesn't have to be $0. It can be zero time. It can be zero input, which is basically how I do Facebook. I don't put any time into social media, which is nice. Again, I'm sometimes out of the loop on stuff. You know, like I didn't hear about chat GTP until the meetup that we had at the beginning of this month. Mm -hmm. And it was like already a week or two old at that point. You know, so I'm, I'm behind the loop on some stuff, but I think it's a cost I'm willing to pay. Sometimes it's worth being behind to not get sucked into things. Yeah. All right, man. Next up. What else can you do if you're getting got? You can do battle. Hell yeah. Get what you want. You can Harry James Potter Evans various this shit. Right? Burn the world down because (laughs) this person's trying to charge you $60 to buy a fucking concert ticket. It's the weirdest thing. I remember very fondly one time I moved into a new apartment. I moved in right at the end of the month. So I had like the last two days of the month in my billing cycle. I think I paid about five cents for water during those two days. But part of every water bill was a $4 fee for the water bill being split up among all the units in the apartment or something. And I was like, (laughs) I'm not not paying $4 on a four cent water bill. I called the place. I was going through the phone tree for maybe an hour, complaining to various people, getting the supervisors. I ultimately like got a supervisor's name who was kind of saying, "Mm, maybe sort of, I don't know, we'll look into it. And then I wrote a a letter to the place and said, this supervisor by this name and employee number uh, agreed that this was a ridiculous charge and uh, that it should be waived and went ahead and got it waived. The amount of time it took me to get those $4 back was entirely out of proportion and not at all worth it. But 
one, it was fun. And two, I felt very self-righteous and good about myself for doing it. I was like, I have done a good thing in the world. If everybody found one little hill like this to die on, then the entire human race would be better off because there'd be less getting got happening. I, I felt like I did a pro-social thing by wasting all that time for $4. Well, and the, the thing is, like, I agree it was a pro-social thing. But what I disagree is that you, it was for 4 bucks. The thing is, it wasn't about the $4. Right. It was right? about the principle. It was about the justice, and you got it. And that's worth <laughs> right. the 10 hours that it took. You know? Yes. Yeah, here. I'm going to one-up you on that. Let me crinkle around some papers here and find this fucking bill. I got a bill last week for $2.35. The invoice, 23 cent administration fee, SWA fee, 83 cents, and sewer, 129, which amounts to 235. Okay. And just because I'm curious, and the website wasn't clear... I called the place and I'm like, hey, there was actually no service I got these fees for. Mm -hmm. Like, I just got a bill for fees. What is this thing? <laughs> right. And it, yeah, it's two bucks, but I'm curious what's going on. And he's like, oh, that's the prorated amount for the I mean, a municipality charge for how we're going to bill you for water. Oh, yes. This whole fucking shakedown. What's funny is I wanted to do this pod, this episode before I got shafted on this thing, but this is just the best example in the world. The complex that's being built out, the development, needs to connect to the local sewer system that's run by the, the government. It always costs some sort of fee to do that because the government is like, you're stressing our infrastructure, it's going to require more maintenance, we may have to build more things out. So there's a fee to connect on a per house basis, whatever it is. I guess the developers are like, well, we can't afford that. Then somebody says, you know what we can do? There's this law where we can incorporate a small municipality where this development is taking place and pass this charge along to the people who want to live there as a type of tax. Yes? Yeah. And not okay. tell them. And, you know, maybe they mentioned something in the five hours that as they're signing papers, you know, a year ago. Oh, yeah, there's a thing for water. But they definitely didn't say it was 70 fucking dollars a month. And so, you know, like you said, I get it. Water has to come here. They had to build infrastructure to get it here. It stresses the existing system. On top of that, though, you pay $2.35 a fucking day for the privilege to use water. This isn't even my water bill. Okay. Yeah, water is on top of this. So if, if, I, if I leave the house and never turn the water on for a month, I owe them 70 bucks, or well, on average, right? $2.35 a day or something. Okay. Which is insane. I'm still in the decision process of like how how much battle am I going to do over this, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and as far as doing battle on this sort of thing, this is a life pro tip for everybody. It never hurts to be nice, and in fact, it's almost always to your benefit. Like, yeah, be nice to the person on the phone. You know, I got a bill a few years ago from a uh, express toll, one of like the the paid toll roads in the Denver area. It was for, like 150 bucks. Oh damn! And it was like you know pink colored paper, which is paper code for important um, or overdue. And I was like, look, I'm sure you get these calls every day, but I haven't been getting these. Because what it was was for like a $4 charge like two years ago. Mm -hmm. It's been having monthly fees of me not paying it. Jesus. I was like, I'm sure you get these calls every day, but I actually haven't been getting these bills. If I had like, why would I call now instead of just keep ignoring it? Can, yeah. we, can we look into this? What we learned is that they've been sending them to my old place in Fort Collins. Oh, and I don't know how it eventually got to where I lived then, but it did. She's like, okay, yeah. So it looks like, you know, I think it was like a $15 charge or something. You know, it wasn't four, but it went up to 150. If I had called and it was like irate, she could have been like pound sand. You didn't pay your bill. That's on you, mm -hmm. you know? Instead, she was like, that makes perfect sense. Let's take off the charge. And oh, you know, I, if I look here, it looks like you have a credit on your account for $12 or something. So you only owe us like $3 and change. Oh my God. And I don't think I had that $12 credit because if I did, okay. they probably would have applied that when I encountered the first charge or whatever, right? She just was happy to help. And like a lot of places too, if you're, if whatever product you have breaks, if you get a hold of the customer service, they'll just give you a new one. I don't want to like encourage unethical life pro tips, but like Otterbox will, if you just call and say, Hey, my Otterbox broke, the, you know, the charging cable I bought from you guys broke. No questions asked. They just send you a new one. They don't even want the broken one. Because it would cost too much to send it back, right? Yeah, I'm assuming so. This was a few years ago, the last time I did this. And actually, the cord was broken. And she couldn't have been nicer about it. She's like, okay, Mr. Zuber, the two cords that you had that were broken, uh, we'll send those to you. And I was like, oh, it was actually just one. And she's like, oh, my mistake, the one cord. But she tried to give me a bonus one, and I stupidly corrected her. But it was because I called politely. Anyway, so yeah. doing battle doesn't mean necessarily getting mad or getting mean. You can be yeah. mad, but be nice about it. So what yeah. I'm going to try and figure out is I'm going to go to like to the the signing registrar's office where like I signed all the paperwork for this house, 
and maybe it's in my five inch tall pile of paper that I have for this place. And I did sign something saying you agree to get fucked every month for water. But if I didn't, I'm kind of curious, like how hard and how annoying I can be to fight this. Cause I, I have some free time and energy. This sounds like a yeah. fun thing to bitch about. And especially if this saves me a thousand fucking dollars a year. That's Are you big kidding deal. me? Anyway, yeah. so that's that's me being irate um right and you will you'll probably learn something about your government while doing all this something that i know won't make me happy <laughs> <laughs> but at least you'll have more knowledge you'll be a more rounded human a, a, a human with more resources at his disposal when you have that knowledge right and i'll be more savvy no consumer in the future yes and i'll be yeah, like look be i want the list of every bullshit municipality subdivision district neighborhood hoa you know, yada, yada. Um, mm -hmm. I want, I want all of that. And I'm actually going to read all that stuff if I ever move yeah. again. Right. The, the thing the post says about uh, getting got is that you may save money, but you pay for it with time and attention. It says you master arcane details, which I still <laughs> think is kind of cool, but again, it's probably something that will never be used in any other aspect. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll teach you how to navigate people and phone trees and learn how to manage systems. You, you it says time. Try to generalize okay. it, yeah, but you're right. Like I might end up learning a lot about my munis my municipality's water nonsense, right? Um, yeah, but it, that that, uh, that won't that specific knowledge won't be useful. This this general thing is, yeah. But you pay with your spare time. Your time disappears. You spend parties talking tricks about you know how to game these systems rather than living life. He warns that if shower thoughts shift to such places, you are paying a high price. I love that. See again, a lot of this is just like. Here's the language you use to yell at clouds, but there's like that that's a huge nugget of wisdom, right? There have been times, as long as we're talking house stuff and I'm gonna rant for a minute, this place, when I zoom out and I look at it, I'm like, oh my god, this is like the model home that we that we dreamt of living in, you know, over a year ago. It's great. When I get into the nitty-gritty and like go around to the magnifying glass, there's so many problems. They're they're fixing almost all of them. But I had to like argue with for a lot of them. Yeah. And some of them are like, oh, no, that's actually not, that's not our thing. It's like, actually, no, it is. Because I pointed this out before, like, there's a chip of wood missing, like a, a noticeable chip, probably like the size of a two fingers Order. size piece of stair missing on one of the stairs. Oh, that's big. At the front. Yeah, it's pretty big. And it's like curved. And it's subtle, but it's absolutely detectable when you're stepping on it. And mm. I could see it missing when I walked through when there was no carpet there. I pointed mm -hmm. it out and I was like, you see this? We need this patched. You don't have to replace the whole thing. Just like make it one piece. I don't care if it's ugly because it'll be covered in carpet. Guess what? They mm -hmm. didn't. Mm -hmm. And you know what's really hard to do is fix one small section of carpet on the stairs. They're going to have to rip up the entire stair carpet to fix that one thing and then put it all back properly. And I'm going to be, you know, hawkish about it to make sure it's done properly. And mm -hmm. I don't care that it's going to take them a bunch of time and money because they, they didn't fix it earlier, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I'm also, really, I'm also nice to the people who come in and do it. I'm polite when I explain the problem, right? Yeah. But I'm like, look, this is actually your guys' problem. It's it's not my thing. So what I'm getting at is I, I have found myself literally thinking about it in the shower. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, okay, I should just like be happy about this. But also, my shower doesn't have shelves in it like I fucking paid for. Um, <laughs> so all of my body wash and stuff is just on the ground, which mm -hmm. they're going to come in and put shelves next month. It's 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 coming, whatever. I don't so much yell at the clouds as I do like kind of just like, okay, you know what? It's not quite getting gone because I'm still here, but it's like, there's no sense in being mad about it, right? Yeah. So I that, that whole rant is to say that it is possible to do battle while keeping your cool, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's nice to stoke that rage just to like keep you motivated if you want to keep fighting mm -hmm. and like just think about what a fucking injustice this is. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't actually have to be mad while you're doing it. Yeah. I think a good example of the costs of getting ready and doing battle is all fucking computers nowadays, and especially the ones in our pockets. People are not users of their own computers anymore. They are a product that is being managed by the people who actually own the software or, or the computer that you use. You can get around that. You can root your system and install your own whatever you want, but that takes a lot of it takes more time and attention and knowledge of computers and, and how to jailbreak them and how to maintain the programs running on them than most people really want to bother with. And I think that really fucking sucks because it doesn't have to be that way. Yet it is because there's a great deal of incentives for the providers to control your shit 
and always bombard you with advertisements and and uh there's there's no incentive at all for them to just give you full access to your tools like you had back in the early days of computing unless you actually have a hacker mentality and the extra time and energy to do those sorts of things most people are just going to get got by the little side brains that they carry around with them which aren't actually fully their property yeah i i think you'd said that we're not users uh i think what you might meant, might have meant to say is that we're not admins we're not owners of our phones right yeah. yeah so i haven't had like a a windows machine for personal stuff for i don't know 20 15 20 years um mm -hmm. and i was just i don't know what the livid is like too too high of a word for it i, w I was flabbergasted when i helped my mom troubleshoot her, troubleshoot her computer and like in the it's a windows computer and like in the finder or whatever it's called on that the explorer yeah there's pop-up advertisements just going around your computer to go to a folder. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Luckily, it's only, you know, 20 minutes of Googling and 60 steps to remove that. And you can. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it's, you know, it, it realistically is five minutes and 10 steps. But it is still way more work than it should be to be like, no, I don't want you trying to sell me shit while I'm perusing my, my music library. Mm -hmm. I've noticed this with Google Maps. I usually use Apple Maps, but Google Maps is now saying things like turn left in a third of a mile right after the Wendy's. Oh, damn. I don't know if you've noticed this yet. And it's not. It has not happened to me. I don't think that yet. The thing is, in this particular case, it was actually helpful because okay. the cross light didn't have a sign on it as to which street it was. So I don't know if it is like subtly going to like start pushing restaurants or drive throughs or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. or if that was actually just like it geniusly helping, mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, you've seen like the comic of like, you know, please drink verification can, Yes, <laughs> you know, it's like, I just want to play my game, please. I just imagine having to go through all those, those hoops, th there will be a tipping point where people are gonna be like, absolutely not. Fuck you. It is now worth it to me. You know? Cause like, you're right. You can jailbreak your phone, which actually is not enough. You've got to like, like you said, take root ownership of it, which you can't really do with an iPhone. You'd have to switch to Android or some hmm. alternative. Um, okay. I'm sure somebody who knows a lot more than I do can do that with an iPhone, but I can't. Then what's your reward at the end of the day? A clunky phone that doesn't work with any of the apps that you're familiar with, right? Yeah. But at least you're not getting bombarded with the shit you don't want. It's a trade-off. It's infuriating. That's the thing is, you know, you pick your, pick your battles. <laughs> my phone app on my iPhone doesn't have a report spam button, but Chrome does. So mm. for that reason, a few months ago, I started forwarding all my email to Chrome or to Gmail. Nice. And I'd start reporting those as spam now. And then nice. Gmail unsubscribes for me. But I'm like, no, I actually want to impact your guys' score. Because like the mm -hmm. the services that send those mass emails, you get scores, kind of like a credit score for your email. If you if if you get tons of oh, spam cool. spam responses, they're gonna start cutting how much you can send. It's a drop in the bucket, but I'm like, no, I'm actually gonna do my little part to punish you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna just delete this or filter it to the straight of the trash. I'm gonna like spam market a spam, and you know you guys are gonna get a ding on your report. Uh, yeah. In the article, it says the biggest downside of doing battle is that you can lose. The example that comes to mind most uh, saliently for me is my brother wrote a small app. He put it on the app store, and he was like, "Why? Why are they taking thirty percent of my money?" If anyone buys this, I'm like, ah, it's just what they do, man. They provided the store and people wouldn't see your app if the store wasn't there. And he's like, but they're not doing anything at all. And I'm like, yeah, you're you're not going to get around paying the 30%. I think fighting with the government will often result in the same thing. Lots of times you can like get away with things, find loopholes or whatever. But uh, ultimately, if you try to fight not paying your taxes and saying you're a sovereign citizen or something, you're going to end up in jail. Yeah, it's that's not a winnable battle. It's a drag that they take, that they take thirty percent, but like it's kind of like a, sh a stock fee at a store, except for the fact that like when you're paying to have your stuff shown at Safeway or whatever, like taking up shelf space, they actually have limited shelf space. Yes. Whereas iTunes does have an unlimited space, but there is no other way for me to get an app on my phone. Actually, yeah. that's not true. If you build a decently designed like progressive web app, you can just save that like save the website to your homepage on your phone. Oh, cool. And you like, so uh, Wordle is the example I have on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the Wordle app. I have like whatever website Wordle went to and I can save it to my home screen and I click it and it just takes me there. There's no URL bar. There's nothing, just the mm -hmm. Wordle app. But anyway, the important thing about losing though, is that if you don't fight, you were going to lose anyway. 
That's true. And so don't burn the world down trying to fight it. But like with my express toll example, I was either going to pay the 150 or call and try to pay less. And if I lost, it's not like they're going to charge me more. It's not like a traffic ticket where in the United States, if you get pulled over, or at least in Colorado, if you get pulled over for a traffic infraction, you can get, well, the way that they get around it is it's a reduced penalty if you just pay it, or you can exercise your constitutional right and contest it in court and thus risk the full punishment, which is like, you know, triple the fine and points against your license. So you're like, you're incentivized to bend over and take it. Um, <laughs> yes. And where we're losing there is actually more than what you would have lost if you had just taken it. Even if the price doesn't go up for fighting it, the fact that you have spent all this time and attention and whatever other resources you spent trying to fight it, you are out those if you don't get anything out of it. It's true. It's a trade-off. Pick your battles. Try to pick winnable ones. Right. You know, with this Which water brings- thing, I'm going to fight it as hard as I can. I'm probably going to lose. So I'm not going to, you know, go to court over it. Mm-hmm. But I will try to find whatever paperwork I signed. And if I signed it, then that's the end of the story. If I didn't, then I'm going to, I'll find my next steps. <laughs> <laughs> well, all that brings us to sometimes you can get gone. Yeah. Tell the game to get fucked. You need good reasons to stick around when things are out to get you. It's often wise to just get gone if you can. And if your instincts say get gone, then get gone. I think he's spot on. That's sort of how I did social media. I do think that is extremely wise to never even get started on that thing. The thing is, like, I just, I stopped having fun with it. To people who who are in it and having internet fights or even just like, you know, even just enjoying stuff. Maybe TikTok or Instagram is better at this, but I got out before those things took off. But it's like, what if I just want to like, if I just want news updates about this video game? I guess Facebook had groups, but still, you know, fuck it. He points out that if getting people is how something survives, you should get gone because this is going to be an existential battle for the thing. I like that. Yeah. If it, if its whole thing is like, we need people, then it's like, oh, okay. Then that means that I'm the product here. You don't want just some of my time. You want all of it. He points out that oftentimes part of the getting got thing is they don't want you to know exactly how much they're going to get got, get you for. So, uh, be careful if you decide not to get gone. Like you think you're getting good odds, but you're probably wrong. You think you know all the tricks they will try, but you're probably wrong. Uh, You think you need something, but (laughs) I love this quote. The word need is thrown around a lot these days. (laughs) (laughs) You very likely don't actually need, need something. So get gone if you can. I like it. He also points out that getting gone is worth making sacrifices, big sacrifices. Sometimes opting out of a system really does cost a lot, but it's worth it for for the freedom, I guess. Part of me likes that he doesn't use a lot of examples, but part of me wishes he would. But then we'd get, anch- you know, the readers would get anchored on those, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a good example of a big sacrifice. Like I don't think Facebook counts. Like mm-hmm. I didn't lose much. Some people might lose more. I don't know. If you're done with the cell phone bullshit, right? Mm-hmm. And you're like, forget it. I, I'm sick of always having people be able to call me. I'm sick of spam calls. I'm just, I'm not going to have a cell phone. That is mm-hmm. a huge sacrifice. I know at least two people now who have dumb phones instead. They can text, but they have to pound it out on the old nine key keypads. Yeah. Where you, you have to push a button multiple times to get a letter. Yeah. They have some basic functionality. They have the GPS, but for the most part, you, you can't use the internet on it. And that is a big sacrifice, but also kind of think it might be worth it. That is pretty cool. Are these two people married by chance? No. Oh, so they're two different groups. Of, okay, so I thought I knew who, who it was. I think I know one of them. So I'm, oh. I'm just amazed that you know two people who are doing this. Yeah. That's hardcore. I've thought about that. It's just, I actually get a lot of utility out of my phone. I realize that I spend a lot of time staring at it. And sometimes I realize it's too much and I deliberately put it down. Mm-hmm. But overall, my time on it is positive. I'm having fun. Just because it's sucking up your time and money doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Just you've got to be constantly vigilant. Like, is this actually giving me something that I want? Mm-hmm. And again, back to the to the top of the post, is like, if I give the thing what it wants, do I actually get anything that I want? And if the answer is no, then yeah, get gone, man. Again, running back to this water example, because I, sh- I should just put the bill out of line of sight so I stop thinking about it. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, if I give them what they want, this ridiculous amount of money for the privilege to not die of thirst, then I get water. I actually get something and they're going to stop at that fee. They're not going to just keep shaking me down until I say, look, I'm, I'm tapped out. I think you're making the mistake of saying that you need something. If you didn't get water from them, you wouldn't actually die of thirst. You could buy bottled water from the store and hoof it in every day. That's true. And I've act- that's on my list of like insane hypotheticals of how I'd handle like if I didn't want to deal with them. Showering would be a pain, but not impossible. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is like, I don't think I actually can opt out. 
Ah. Um, I, I'm, I'm just assuming because if I could, people just would. The thing is, my water has to go somewhere unless they're going to like come have people come out to my house and build specific blockages so my I'm blocked from the sewer system. I don't think opting out is actually an option. Um, okay, but I haven't checked. Maybe it is, and they're like, yeah, you can jump through all these hurdles and opt out. You just have mm-hmm. to pay for your own infrastructure to get your water removed from your property. <laughs> they're like, okay, yeah. Suddenly this this fee sounds a little more reasonable. At the end he, of this get gone section, he says, if you cannot get gone, do not engage more than necessary. Go into easy mode, get what you must, then get gone. And kind of reminded me that it was interesting. That was kind of my attitude towards work in the last three or so years of my career, where I was just kind of showing up and doing as little as possible and collecting the benefits for it, which is a terrible way to work. And I don't recommend it to anyone unless they're literally trying to get out like I was. I don't know. It was weird feeling like the system sucked and I didn't care about it. And I was just going to try to suck as much out as I could on my way out. I feel bad just saying that. Now I feel maybe I should cut this out. No, I think this this has a name apparently called quiet quitting. The short version at my job in September, I remember because the the deadline was my birthday, September 30th. A couple weeks into the month, the CTO sent out an email to the engineering team saying, hey, look, this is a startup. We need you guys to like actually work, not, you know, nights and weekends. Don't, but you know, don't, don't die for the job. But like, this isn't one of those like kind of just punch in, slack off, punch out kind of jobs. I'm paraphrasing. He was actually much more uh, less charitable sounding in text than, hmm. than I'm giving him credit for. But what he said was, we'll pay you $3,000 if you leave by the end of the month. That's actually a pretty awesome offer. It works for everybody. I think uh, this might not be Amazon. Somebody, there's two, two main companies that actually do this. The idea is like, look, it saves us both time and money. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be here. If you half-ass it for half a year till we figure it out and fire you, it's going to cost us a lot more than $3,000. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just give you a, be- a bonus check to get out and go get a job that you can slack off at? Anyway, the idea of quiet quitting came up then when I was talking to people about it, where it's like, no, fuck the system. I'm going to go in, do the minimum, get paid, fuck the management, fuck my company, yada, yada. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think you were that bad, but that it, there is a mentality there. But your, your thing was just like, look, I'm done working. Yeah, I'm going to do the yeah. job. I'm not going yeah. to fuck you guys, but I'm also not going to like try. Right. Because why should I? Well, no, no, I, I, I get that completely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things they're paying for is for people to try. Well, and you know, you, you pay for it in different ways. Part of it is like, yes, we give you a competitive salary so that you want to try here. But like the other thing too is like, if you just actually like your job and you like what you're doing, like I like my job, I like what I'm doing. I'm in the beginning stages of like actually going extra miles so I can be better at parts of my job that aren't actually parts of my job. The industry is basically uh, aerospace geometries. I don't know much about any of that any of that industry at all, and I could probably stay, you know, in the engineering department for years and years and barely learn anything about how any of that works because it doesn't really matter. Someone will tell me what needs doing, but I'm actually curious. I'm driven to learn more about our spot in the actual industry just so I can be like subtly better at my job. Like, oh, actually, no, the FAA needs this, so we need to do yeah. it this way. Like, if I can be the guy knowing that stuff, that'd be cool. That's awesome. That's what people want when they hire people. Yeah, so I guess not patting myself on the back, but I think I'm actually a good employee, so. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We want someone who wants to do this, and we are happy to pay them money to keep them, you know, alive and keep them going while they're doing this for us. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, that's the end of getting got. Now everyone knows they're out to get you, and everyone knew that, but now I think you have some more specific language to be armed with and some tools. Yeah. Get gone, get got, get compact, or get ready. Yeah, I also think, and I know this is basically common sense, but remember that not everything is out to get you. There's lots of things out there that really aren't and find those things because those are the best things that you want to interact with the most. Constant vigilance, sure, but not to the point where you can't enjoy stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Like, we're not out to get you. That said, you can find (laughs) us at Patreon and we'll take as much money as you can give us. Well, did we want to talk about the restaurant posts? These these weren't particularly exciting ones, but then we're going to get on to, let's say, more fun ones. I don't want to say these are bad, but... (laughs) <laughs> uh, zero and one are not probabilities as a follow-up to what we talked about like a month ago because we didn't do these last week or last episode yeah. it reiterates the point that positive and negative infinity are not integers but rather special symbols for talking about the behavior of integers and i really liked that phrasing because i don't remember hearing it put that way before yeah like i haven't talked about infinity in real life since i was a kid mm-hmm. and just kind of like the idea of like well if i had five to infinity is it bigger so the, the, I think the post, this is why I think it's not like the most fun one I've read is that like, it gets a little, it gets mathy. And if you're a math nerd, you'll love it. If you're not, mm. 
A, I think it's really hard to talk about math, although I did listen to this episode or listen to this post and not read it. So that might have been part of why it was a little less fun. But I'm also just not a math nerd. I think that's definitely a big part of it because I am also not a math nerd, but when it got to that big paragraph about the odds ratios and transforming them into probabilities, like I sat down, I reread it again after I read it. And then I didn't like, you don't reread it when you're trying to figure out these sorts of puzzles, but you keep taking little pieces of it back and forth and seeing how they apply and trying to work the details and the relationships out together. And like, I got it after a few minutes. And honestly, it was kind of fun to like puzzle it out. Like, why is the the odds ratio one to five on a die? That only takes a few seconds to figure out and then to double check how the probability works out. But it was like a little puzzle piecing it all together. And I had a bit of fun doing it, but also I guess I wouldn't really choose to do those sorts of puzzles anymore. And it reminded me how much I've stopped caring about games. I don't know if this is just a aspect of getting older where you start moving away from the explore phase of life and going more into the exploit things because figuring out puzzles like that I think is definitely more explore mindset and like I just don't care about games nearly as much as I used to. They aren't intrinsically fun often anymore and this was like yeah that was fun to do one time. I wouldn't want to just keep doing these sorts of puzzles as a fun activity. For what it's worth, you're not quite out of the explorer mentality yet because you're doing all kinds of cool stuff, right? You just well, ex- you just explored the Bay Area for a solstice party. You're going to Europe, et cetera. Maybe you're exploiting experiences out of those rather than exploring. But yeah, yeah, it could I, be. when you brought up gaming, you bring up an interesting thought for me, which is when you're playing a game, you can play it or you can play to game it, right? Like you can ramer mm-hmm. the game, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. min-max, find all the ways to stack the certain buffs where you're, it's as good as possible. So like I'm, I've been playing for the last year, uh, Back for Blood, the Left 4 Dead successor. You know, the new character has bleed damage as a perk that comes native with them. People have put together like long Excel spreadsheets where if you then stack in the other things with like these cards, these multiply, these ones are additive. This character, this other <laughs> character's team buff adds this. Well, this person's bleed damage can be through the fucking roof, and I'm like, I really don't care that much. <laughs> I like shooting right. zombies, right? Mm-hmm. But there are different levels to enjoy the game on, right? Some people love that stuff. Yeah. And I'm playing with somebody online or whatever, and they're talking about how they're doing that. Like, yeah, that's really cool. That's interesting. But I'm not going to put in an hour of work to figure out exactly who to, how to set up my team so that I can get the most damage per bullet possible, right? Right. I just got to shoot him in the face. Like, <laughs> that, that's my kind of game. Um, mm-hmm. there, there was a line in there. He says that the difference between any two degrees of uncertainty equals the amount of evidence you would need to go from one to the other. Yes, that was the key thing in here. Great insight. Oh, you also put that in bold on the notes too. Yeah, perfect. I did, yeah. He he points out that like zero and one are numbers and uh, probabilities are numbers. And so it seems like zero and one should be probabilities, but there's multiple ways to handle the concept of probabilities. And for example, when you transfer probabilities into odds ratios, one goes to positive infinity. And positive infinity is not a number. You can't do math to it. And uh, at least not in the probabilistic sense here. When you transform probabilities to log odds, zero goes to negative infinity and one goes to positive infinity. So again, both zero and one are not numbers in terms of these probabilities. So you shouldn't use them for those. And that's also when he's talking about log odds, where he points out that the distance between any two of these yeah, degrees of uncertainty is how much evidence you would need to go from one to the other, which is a absolutely wonderful way of thinking about it. Yeah. Like I don't have a percentage, a confidence level on how sure I am that the recording software and the backup that I'm using are sufficient that this audio won't be lost, right? It's high enough that I'm not going to bother to think about it. Yes. There was a time a couple of years ago when it wasn't, and I was very worried about it. The episode... Right before we did our HPMR wrap-up call with Yudkowsky, we had an episode with Richard Acton, I believe, and he was in Europe, was for the Basin Conspiracy. My audio for that was lost. Yeah. Then I'm like, oh, now I'm not confident at all that my stuff is working. I I had triplicate backup for the next one, but I didn't have numbers. Combining the previous thing about log odds with distance between two degrees of uncertainty equals the amount of evidence you need to change your uncertainty position. Using the log odds exposes the fact that reaching infinite certainty requires infinitely strong evidence, just as infinite absurdity requires infinitely strong evidence. So you can't 
<laughs> like there's literally no amount of evidence that can make you infinitely certain because there's no such thing as an infinite amount of evidence. The second post was beautiful math. I don't know that there's much to talk about in it. Like it's good to read it because it is a very salient example of the beauty in math and how it just kind of arises intrinsically from the fact that numbers are a thing. Are they a thing? I don't know. It's as he says in here, this is what creates the impression of a mathematical universe that is out there in Platonia, a universe which humans are exploring rather than creating. These things that emerge from it are not anything that anyone built into it. It wasn't anything that was expected. It emerges from the system and the system appears to be tied directly to how the universe actually exists, at least as far as we can perceive it. This is the sort of thing back when I thought about philosophy more, I thought was kind of interesting, but I never even got that into, which you'd think I would. The thing is like, are numbers real or is math real? Sounds to me like a wrong question. It's not real in the same way that like this mug of co this mug of water, because now it's not coffee, is next to me, right? However, the fact that there is one mug is a real fact, right? Mm -hmm. So it it's different. I think real is doing too much work there. There was an interesting conversation with this, uh, I think it was Max Tegmark, or maybe it was David Deutsch. In any case, there is amongst the elite mathists and math philosophers discussion and disagreement about this. I think it's cool. Like for me, like beautiful math is just like, I don't know, random, like nothing that it goes beyond like third grade math. Or it's kind of fun knowing how to get a percentage, you know, if you have two values or mm -hmm. something, right? That's about the limit of the math I do day to day. It is just kind of fun to think about the patterns that are always, always true. It just seems really cool to me that these patterns do emerge. And as Yudkowsky says, the amazing thing is that math is a game without a designer. That's pretty cool. What's nice about this post is that I don't see how this gets us any closer to AI alignment, which means that it's just Yudkowsky indulging himself and how fun math is. And I fully endorse that. If this is fun to you, have fun, man. It's great. It might be related in some way, and also AIs run on math, but then again, everything runs on math, so. And, you know, okay, you're right. If I give it a little more thought into it, he's like, look, math is needed for AI alignment. Math is actually cool, despite what they told you in school. Math is fun yeah. and beautiful, not ugly and scary. And so yes. you, should, you should love math like I do, and then you can help work on AI alignment. <laughs> I do think this post is really worth reading because if you don't have a intuition for how beautiful math can be, Reading this really helps bring that out because it is, it's really cool shit. Uh, and it's a very short post and it is going to probably be important for the uh, next few posts that we read because the next one is expecting beauty. And the one after that is, is reality ugly? Spoiler alert. Depends. <laughs> Those are what we'll be reading yep. next time. All right, man. Well, we have two orders of business before we wrap up here. Two, two. you say. One, okay. we have to thank this episode's patron, without whom this episode would not be possible. This yes. fortnight, we have Edward Huff, total hero. Yes, thank you very much for supporting us. We offer this podcast for everybody, and we hope that enough people find some value in it that they're willing to throw back a few dollars for us so we can keep it going. Totally. If you can, no pressure. It's awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you all again in two and weeks. Thank you, buddy. This was fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you as well. It was nice having a topic that someone else brought forward. I will do it more often. I, if anyone doesn't know this, Enos does 90% of the heavy lifting for the show. Let no one walk away thinking that he's not doing most of the work. <laughs> I couldn't do it without you too, though, so thank you very much. You'd just be reading blog posts. <laughs> I know. All right, man. Well, I'll catch you soon, and uh, thanks again. Cool. Thank you. Bye.